thank you, everyone. You guys, this is truly a customers of patience situation. It's been a long day, but it's been a really good day. And I, for one, thank the Rouge Forum. I thank Wayne. I thank Sandra for your work in putting this together. And I thank all of you for, for your amazing scholarship sustained over a long time. And so I have a minor contribution to make um, as these things go. You know, it's kind of like we're on the back of the of the schedule today. I had a colleague say, we're done at 3.15. I said, 4.15, no. Uh, it's like your students, you give them one page or syllabus, and you know, And you say the other 20 pages are on mine. But um, here we are, we're gonna keep rolling. So thank you very much. I have a paper, and um, if you are, our institute, um, the, the paper's online if you're interested. I think it's a, it's a helpful paper. You know, I mean, sometimes we've all been through this. There are some things I've written I wish I hadn't written. <laughs> there are some things I've published I wish they had never been published. This, however, I'm, I'm quite happy with. And I want to really thank Cassandra and Wayne for the encouragement and the work through this. And this paper, in a way, um, you know, sometimes, sometimes you get lucky. Sometimes it's sort of like a, you know, an auto writing situation. Sometimes the paper just writes you. In this case, this paper has been writing me for a couple of years, but more intensively prepping for this. When you put the deadline, thir 13, Friday the 13th, half the paper. <laughs> so here we are. Okay, so what do I have about 15 minutes in here or so? Yeah. Okay, I'll, I'll read a little bit and try to get you through the thesis and a bit. And then this is the situation where this is the, the panel. And, as well, um, where we're going to try to bring bring forward, I think some some ideas of what to do. And my paper is more or less sort of like um, like how to keep doing what we've been talking about all of, all day. You know how to deal with these kids that, that Maya was talking about. Um, you know basically how to do it at any level, inside, outside, whatever it may be, and not get fired. So <laughs> that's the theme of the paper. If that's if that's at all possible. David Noble says getting fired is not a bad thing, and I think he rested in his day that um, he was fired a number of times, so, but hung in there as best he could. And this, this paper is actually dedicated to Dave, and also um, in solidarity, as we have been all day, with 200, 185,000, nearly 200 students in Quebec, and maybe up to 200,000, for two months, marching on the streets, striking, protesting, and that's student power. That's a student movement that I hope in Canada we see. Um, I hope it's, it's, it's a wave that sweeps north, south, east, west in Canada. So, so in, in that way, a little bit. So I'm gonna, I'll, I'll walk through the introduction here a bit, and I'll read a bit to, and then talk a bit as well, okay? Uh, and this will get you first, first um, introduction in the first part of the thesis. Okay, so call them Jaron Generals. Well, let me just preface to say, the paper is about Criticat, okay? Criticat, two things in this paper. The etiquette of critique, or the etiquette of criticism, okay? And I make some distinctions along the way between criticism and critique as we want to do. So it's kind of, you know, coining a term here, a criticat, which, by the way, it's, has, has an incredibly interesting history. So I historicize it a bit. But criticat also, in a way that Foucault talks about those, you know, small, everyday criticisms. You know, so those tiny criticisms that we make of ourselves and make of each other. And then that etiquette of criticat and how that changes over time. And how as scholar activists, we, we um, we engage with each other, engage with the world, and basically engage then with, with the troubles that we run into along the way. Okay, so that's what the paper's about. Um, call them Jaron generals, correspondence cops, police of polemic, or tribunes of text. Administrators are once again shoring up powers over the everyday speech utterances of faculty and students. This is the gist of a troubling trend across institutions of higher education in Canada and the US, albeit a trend that is spiked in other areas as well. Whereas after September 11, 2001, 
faculty members, students have diligently defended the scholar activism of <coughs> researching and reporting on abuses of power in political affairs and foreign policies. It seems time once again to defend, defend the academic freedom to speak more locally on the academic affairs and policies of our own institutions, especially in the throes of mismanagement. Yes, Stanley Fish, we are just doing our job, speaking on the management of academic manners and matters without fear or reprisal or sanction, fear of reprisal or sanction, and that remains a core aspect of academic freedoms for the definition. <coughs> Reinforcing the powers of officials to police speech on campus or respectful workplace policies or laws and what emerges as the new credit cap of higher education. Now don't get me wrong, I affirm anti-discrimination, non-harassment policies for protected classes and grounds, and I support necessary accommodation for categorical identity claims. Correspondingly, I know full well that rules of order and argumentation have been necessarily customary in higher education for centuries. And going ad hominem on someone and dragging red herrings through criticism divert attention from issues and matters to manners and mannerisms. The issue is not, it's getting to the thesis now, the issue is not that unwritten or pre-political academic manners are now written in the form of these new respectful workplace policies, nor is the issue whether or not unelected big chill boomers, like baby boomers, qua appointed managers are arbitrarily or selectively authoring intellectual and civil law. These policies end up to be legal policies. The respectful workplace policies distract from, erode or suppress protected areas and grounds. They suppress, erode academic freedom, rules of order and argumentation, and faculty governance. To prepare scholar, this is what I want to do, to prepare scholar activists for a debate and a real political contest as we've been talking about all day here, it's necessary to ask how and why the critique of critique and post-critical turn pamper the little ethics of criticism. And I think we know as scholars of, of critique scholars of criticism, that there has been a very intense over time for 10, maybe 15, maybe 20 years, an intense undermining of the power of critique, and as such, hence the post-critical turn, hence the critique of critique. Okay? That's what I want to get at. That's what I get at theoretically in the paper, actually. Um, okay. So, what do you got to do? So, belittling the new critique and critique of critique means that students and faculty can at least think about being critical, always again and again, and again indebted to old school activism. After localizing, historicizing, and theorizing the new criticat, one pardon is vague, we don't want to be governed like this. I was running quickly through a little bit and then jump ahead. By the mid to just running a little bit on, on the trends in, in Canada and the US on, on these new um, respectful workplace and respectful environment policies. By the mid 2000s, institutions began to introduce respectful workplace policies, seemingly overreacting, overreacting to Judith Rhodes' position on regulated speech. Rhodes didn't curb speech at the University of Pennsylvania through the new credit cut, unlike managers at other universities. In November 2005, Brock University approved a respectful work and learning environment policy conflating more conventional policies for equity and harassment with expensive clauses and speech codes for bullying and criticism. Definitions of bullying under this new policy include asserting a position of intellectual support, superiority, quoting here, in an aggressive, abusive, or offensive manner. The Brock's environment policy advises critiquette, stressing that bullying can occur when criticism is destructive, not constructive. All right, that's critiquette. Is criticism of the person rather than her his mistakes? When an extensive, with an ex extensive anti-harassment policy, anti-harassment policy already, instead of introducing a respectful environment policy, Queens University hired six student dialogue facilitators in November 2008 to roam campus and intervene with spontaneous teaching moments. <laughs> honestly, paid um, in discourse identified as problematic. An administrator admitted that the critics that, that critics immediately voiced alarms that, um, quote, these people are expected to act as thought and speech police, unquote, but insisted that they were just 
assuring respectful conversation and dialogue. Christened the language police, administrators can the facilitators in mid-February 2009, just to too much resistance. Concerns were raised as more universities introduced and imposed uh, policies similar to broader ponder dialogue, dialogue squat measures like Queens. By the end of 2011, at least, but to, you know, last year, at least 11 universities across Canada had respectful workplace or, or environment policies. Similar things happened in the U.S. and some of you may be, um, may be quite familiar and intimately familiar with those. And so, um, so I'm going to jump way ahead now in the paper after going through, um, you know, it's, I had a fun time working through the history of Criticat, as in, you know, first, it's fun just, you know, playing with the word, playing with an etiquette, and you do an Emily Post, actually, maybe I'll start with Emily Post and read a little bit there about what Emily has to say, if I can find it. Um, yeah, so if you're gonna do a, an etiquette of critique, no better place to, to no better consultant <laughs> than Emily Post, and yeah, granddaughter Elizabeth and great granddaughter Peggy, okay? Um, great granddaughter in law. Um, and, and Emily Post just came out with a, with a very hip new, new volume, actually. So, in Emily Post's Etiquette in Society and Business, in Politics, and at Home, first published in 1922, roles of criticism are presented as key to progressive manners, matters, morals, and taste. The first rule of critiquette, uh, you, you know, you pour through a couple hundred pages with Emily, and, and yeah, <laughs> so <laughs> you, know, you dig down, as they say, we're getting administrative, we're going to drill down. So I, I drilled down in Emily Post, and um, lo and behold, Emily has a lot to say about criticism, trust me. So, the first rule of critiquette is assured, this is <laughs> Emily, the first rule of critiquette is assured danger to be avoided. Post clarifies, and this danger to be avoided is what she calls a rank habit of a critical attitude, which, like a weed, will grow all over the place if you let it have half a chance. <laughs> <laughs> so um, work on yourself. That's the that's the Foucauldian internalization of of etiquette. On the other hand, controlling situations wherein criticism may occur is basic critiquette as well. For example, it may be tempting to collect, if you're throwing a party, it may be tempting to collect, quote, the smartest and most critical people around your table. But if you really want to avoid bungling a dinner, invite only people who are congenial to one another. <laughs> this, is a first of, this is a first importance. And I know a lot of you are thinking about your university. <laughs> How did they hire me? They should have used Emily, but I'm here at the table. All right, so. Um, same holds true for guests. Quote, it's unforgivable to criticize your host or her or his friends. Once in the club, if not the workplace, Emily Post emphasizes, you have no right to criticize the management, the rules of the organization, or the club. Never forget this critiquette, she reiterates, reiterates, given that consequences could be fatal. If someone dislikes your manner, you may be unsuitable or blackballed through a few tacit, co covert letters. For editions published by Post's granddaughter-in-law, Elizabeth, in the 1960s and 70s, Criticette was less of an issue in the 60s and so aligning etiquette with, with Amy Vanderbilt's complete book of etiquette. And in Amy's, Amy's book, Amy just says pretty much, you know, another couple hundred pages, drilling down, <laughs> just contain your criticism, um, says Amy. Recent academic uh, text, texts of the genre, um, such as Civility, colon, Manners, Morals, and the Etiquette of Democracy, nonetheless harken back to great-grandmother Emily with pre-political virtues for Criticette to recognize that civility allows criticism of others and sometimes even requires it, but the criticism should always be civil. Okay, uh, about five more minutes. So I'm going to jump ahead to some things that are helpful. I do work through a history there and have fun with that. Um, sort of cultural studies of critique, criticism, and, and criticette. Um, historicizing, theorizing, about four or five sections to the paper. So getting to, to kind of the academic freedom section. 
talking a little bit about, you know, one of the things about, about academic freedom, and I and this, this this article is in, this manuscript is in, I like to say impressed, but we all do, <laughs> about something we, you've submitted that's been reviewed and under-reviewed and things like that, with, with the Journal of Academic Freedom. Um, so Carrie Nelson, who's a long-standing um, hardcore advocate and hardcore, um, hardcore um, just, just um, intellectual and a uh, great intellectual within, within um, uh, academic freedom and, and also you know, lit studies and so on and so forth. So they're considering it, it down there. So there's, a, there's an academic freedom um, emphasis as well. But let me jump to some things that might be that might be helpful. I think just to sort of um, just to inspire a few things that I think are quite helpful here. Um, and that's this notion of reasonable hostility, because we're seeing a lot of this this notion of sort of like you know approach your um, as Mark Kingwell puts it, you know, um, with all the civility talk and things like that. Um, Mark observes that, that arguments for restraint, and there's a lot of testimony to this, this is just more theorizing a bit, you know, quote, arguments for restraint both act to maintain the status quo and it disguise the fact that the status quo is oppressive. They are ideolo ideological through and through the white glove of politeness concealing powers and Okay, and so what are some things that we can do? Just a few more minutes. What are, the, what are some of the things that, that we can do? Or so they, they're kind of some, some theoretical work, it's con some conceptual work. I think that's very helpful. And uh, so I'll read a little bit about, about that. And that's, and that's some work that Karen Tracy has, uh, has generated. And really, I think, just not only um, just fascinating in the way that she handles it, her argument, but also extremely helpful for us, okay? And that's bringing this, this, this argument forward against that sort of like discourse of civility, you know, and, and the white glove of politeness, concealing powers are in fist. Our, we need to bring forward a discourse of reasonable hostility, that there are times and there are moments when our passions, our emotions, affect, needs to be entertained, needs to be celebrated, needs to be given time, places at the table, and so on and so forth. So this is a little bit on Karen Tracy and, and reasonable hostility. Academic freedom, shared governance, and democratic rule of higher education are at risk of being smothered by the white glove of politeness and clobbered by the iron fist. Quote, rather than seeing public talk occasions as needing politeness or civility, a better norm Karen Tracy proposes is reasonable hostility. She effectively hashes out parameters for democratic com communicative practice and flips, quote, the aphorism above on its head. It's not merely how something is said, but what a person says that matters. Because we're hearing a whole lot about, it's not what you say, it's how you say it. Um, oh, Karen Tracy flips that on its head. She then asks, in spite of educational governance, how should situation appropriate face attack be defined? Quote her at length here for a bit. Only certain types of face attack are legitimate and desirable in local governance situation. She, she does ethnographies with this. She says, reasonable hostility is the name for acts that are. Reasonable hostility involves person-directed attack. It is Remarks that imply disrespectful, undesirable things about others. Targets of reasonable hostility will judge speakers uttering those remarks to be rude, disrespectful, unfair, and so on. And you're not human if you haven't had those remarks come back to you. That's just, you know, we're, you know it's, it's even hard to say that um, most animals don't, don't feel those remarks at some time or another. A speaker ought to be. A speaker, a speaker might be cognizant that his or her remarks may have this effect, but their purpose is to express outrage about a wrong. The speaker sees self-central aim as witnessing a truth 
or expressing righteous indignation. The judgment that someone's remark are an instance of reasonable hostility then rests not only on what was said and how, but also whom to whom, situation specific. It is essential that dissent and the emotional expression that accompanies it be legitimated. If ordinary democracy is to flourish, not only must hostile expression be permitted, but the positive function it serves must be recognized. Across time and occasions, governance groups need to be, need bits of civil and hostile talk. So I think I'll just stop there, Sandra, and then pass the torch over to my colleagues here, and then, and then we'll talk with you. Thank you very much. Thanks. Thank you.